service Wednesday night. I know it's been mentioned, but I don't want you to show up and think the rapture took place and think, man, I didn't make it because if you're going out to the fireworks stand, you'll find some people, okay? And then uh, this week is the 4th of July week, and we want you to enjoy your families is what it is and be, you know, make it a family deal. And so, so, so don't forget, no Wednesday night service, but tonight... I really want to invite you back. I know it's already been said, but I'm telling you from the pastor, we need you here tonight, okay? Because, and it's not going to be a long service. It's always a short service, but they came, they come, and they bless us with their testimonies. It's the women that are, well, they're trying to get free. Not all of them are completely free. And so they, 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 need, they need to come to church and feel the presence of God, and, and they give us testimony, uh, the ones that are here, but they bring some others that are new, and, and uh, the ones that will give testimony is how God brought them out and raised them up and delivered them, and God's done a lot of that, hadn't he? Brother Lewis and Sister Lewis are gone today. Uh, they, they went to Oklahoma City. It was, I think it's the 75th anniversary of their church, uh, not their church, <laughs> of the church they were going to, Bethesda Church in Oklahoma City. And uh, uh, he, Brother Lewis got saved uh, there, and it was back a few years before I did, and he was, he was on drugs and ran wild, and he lived on the south side like I did. And... Uh, uh, not quite the legend I was, but uh, I'm kidding, okay. I'm just the legend in my own mind. But uh, he's given his testimony this morning down there because there, it's something about giving your testimony that changes lives. You say, this is what God did in my life. And I know he can do it in your life. And you say, well, they, you know, they, they see me all the time and they don't think I'm really all that and uh, it doesn't matter they should have known you before you knew the Lord that's what I tell people I've had a lot of how can you be a Christian because Jesus saved me amen one guy said well with your background how in the world could you be a preacher I said well I'm in pretty good company because Paul was a murderer I never murdered nobody except you know in my thoughts just hadn't acted it out yet. Praise God. Key words yet. Hey, Amen. So y'all better straighten up. Just kidding. Just kidding. But God changes lives. That's what I'm going to talk about today. I want to talk about God changing your life. And if your life has not been changed, if it's changed and yet you still need another change, I'm going to tell you something. What you need is a divine encounter. See, that's the difference between people that just go to church and sit in a pew and sing a song and amen a preacher, and if I'm lucky, uh, and, 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 and just go through the motions, uh, and, and those kind of people. And then you got the kind of people that has had an encounter with God, and they, when they sing, they sing out of their heart. And when they praise God, it's out of the abundance of the heart because they've been changed. When you've been changed, it makes all the difference in the world. When you've come in contact with God. Hey, guys, let me say, I keep forgetting. I know this don't look, this doesn't sound. We need to fix the lights up here, okay? We hadn't changed them since the play. <laughs> I got one blaring in my eyes here. Thank you. Well, I'm not going to look as good on TV. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> just kidding come on now y'all get alive with me here a little bit we won't take all day but just listen to me when you've been changed it changes the way it, it affects the way that you even go to church it affects the you know before I went to church before I got saved mama she, she used to she used to come down to the creek to find me seriously I used to have a creek I lived in Oklahoma City absolutely I was a city slicker absolutely but we had a creek. Put a little country in me. Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? My mama came to find me at the creek. He said, Guy, where are you? Oh, that's my mama. What's mama doing down here? Hide the stuff, man. <laughs> Amen. Here comes mama. She had to get me by the hair of the head sometimes, drag me to church. I was a drug addict. She drugged me to church. Hated it. Hated it. 
But when I got saved and really, really saved, man, that's where I wanted to be. My car would break down periodically now and then and run out of gas now and then. And there's times I had to walk to church, and, man, I didn't mind at all walking to church. As long as I get there, I'm going to get there any way I can because there was a change in me. It wasn't that you got to go to church to be a Christian. No, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That's technically right. But let me tell you something. This is the truth. When you become a Christian, you want to go to church. You want to hear the Word of God. You want to learn more. You want to grow. You want to you experience more of what you got, and you want to have him that which apprehended you. You want to catch that which caught you. Well, anyhow, I guess I'm the only excited person in the place. But I'm telling the truth. So help me, God. Turn with me to Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter 3. I want to read five verses. It's a narrative, and yet is, there's a real New Testament principle here. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. And he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and beheld, or behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Man, when God calls your name twice, you better listen. And he said, here I am. Or here am I. And he said, draw not hither. Don't come any closer. Put off your shoes from off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. You may be seated. Moses had an encounter with God. And the rest is history. We're partially here today because of this divine appointment with God on the backside of a desert. We're here today because it was from that that everything began to roll and it rolled on into the New Testament and Jesus came and died and was buried and rose again and now 2,000 years have passed and let me tell you something, that great meeting in the desert affects you, it affects me, it affects the world. And you think about it, and I thought about it, you know, who really would have thought that he would have had a divine encounter with God on the backside of a desert? I mean, you would have really thought, and I would have thought, I mean, the modern way of thinking is if, they were gonna, if he was going to have an encounter with God, it probably would have been in a cathedral, it, could, it should have been in a church, it should have been in some, you know, elaborate place, uh, some, some place that religion would call a holy place. I've been to some holy places, that's what they call them. Places like where Jesus uh, healed the man with a withered hand, I've been there. The place where Jesus walked down the hill and got on a donkey and rode it into Jerusalem. We would call that a holy place, the place where Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the place that he died called Calvary, the tomb that he was in, that he was resurrected. You know, there are a lot of places we call holy places, but you know what? That's just what religion calls them holy because in the reason they do is because at some time in some place in history, the God of heaven was there, okay? He was present, and somebody, had an encounter with him at that point. And so that's why we call them holy places because somebody had an encounter with God and when they had that encounter with God, uh, well, guess what we do? We make a shrine. And we build shrines. 
And we say that's where God met with somebody or that's where God touched somebody and we make a shrine. But these places I'm talking about, I want you to know, are not holy because that's where God was. Uh, Let me tell you something. It's holy because it's where God is. And wherever God is, it becomes holy. Amen. That's why the Bible calls you a holy temple. Holy temple. Not because you... You know, you, you do everything perfect. <laughs> I wish, wish we could, but we can't. Not because you are the perfect specimen of a Christian. Some of y'all are bad advertisement. Amen, I got to admit. Been times, I won't say it, but anyhow. But I'm saying that's not it. It's because you've had a divine encounter with God. And he's made you holy. He's washed you in his blood. He's cleansed you of your iniquities. Uh, He's changed this nature. And now we become a brand new creature in God. uh, A place where God can dwell. A place where God can rest. A place where God can set up residence and become the president uh, and set on the the throne of our hearts uh, and be the leader of our life that's what I'm talking about but what this narrative of Moses demonstrates to us is what makes a place holy is not what took place there years ago but the active now presence of God uh, where God is right now and not where he was yesterday uh, you see God is is liable to show up any place anytime God is liable to show up uh, in the middle of a marijuana party when it was against the law (laughs) he can do it now even though they've never mind we won't go there but he can show up in a bar some of y'all got saved in a bar got your little drink and sit down music playing you're cheating Give me another double. And then the Spirit of God got to dealing with you. And your cheating heart got saved uh, and right and made new. Somebody say amen. And I've told you before, I've got a friend, I say a friend, an acquaintance years ago, and he's still preaching, that got saved in a Van Halen concert. I meant right there in the middle of it. They got up and said even Jesus couldn't save somebody in a Van Halen concert. The Spirit of God fell on him. He was convicted. He fell on his knees and said, Lord, save me. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Uh, and from that day to this, he's been a preacher of the gospel. Uh, let me tell you, God can save anybody, any place, any time uh, and he shows up God shows up uh, he shows up uh, and that's what this is telling us at any place at any time to anybody that burning bush represents the presence of God Uh, and when the presence of God shows up uh, let me tell you something it'll change your life can I tell you Moses didn't go to the backside of the desert and to find a burning bush Uh, that burning bush showed up on the backside of the desert uh, to find Moses Uh, he would have found him anywhere he was when God gets ready to get you and touch you uh, He will be there, uh, and it doesn't matter where it's at. Uh, And so what I'm trying to tell you is uh, that God can touch you in the most unlikely places uh, at the most unlikely times. A divine encounter with God. See, when Moses first sees the burning bush, he, 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 he can't describe it. Uh, except maybe in some, you know, wow, i got to see this natural phenomenon this thing is not right there's something ain't right here you know one of these bushes up well we don't have any bushes anymore do i told y'all to get rid of them we did thank god you listened to me amen okay we don't have any didn't like them but you see the thing is that that that, that, that the burn if you walk outside we got some shrubbery out there sister tina where she at amen she told me she cleaned them up and I'm glad she didn't. She did it, not me. Amen. I would have murdered them. Amen. But if you walked outside and you saw a burning bush, and man, you're leaving, you say, you wouldn't say, hmm, look at that bush on fire. Wait a minute, that bush ain't being that bush on fire, but it ain't being consumed. It ain't getting burned up. You know what? We could have church out there, wouldn't you say? 
Well, Moses had church right there on the backs of the because burning bushes aren't supposed to happen. And so maybe he was saying it was a freak of nature or, or a phenomenon of nature. Uh, M- Moses sees what skeptics might call an optical illusion. Uh, but let me tell you something. This is no mistake. This is no optical illusion. Uh, this is not a phenomenon of, uh, of, of nature. Uh, it's not a freak of nature. Uh, it is the almighty God that got inside of a bush. Uh, and that bush caught on fire and God kept it from being consumed uh, and it caught that man's attention that day uh, and you know what God will use anything to get your attention uh, and God will do anything to get you uh, that you might stop looking at your life uh, and start looking at a life beyond what you have amen you see in the fire God was and from the fire and with the fire God speaks And God speaks with clarity. And he calls Moses by his first name, Moses. And he did it twice. Moses, Moses. Years ago when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, they don't listen anymore because E.F. Hutton went bankrupt. I got news for you. God didn't go bankrupt and he calls your name. You better listen. You better listen. And I'm telling you, God called my name the night I got saved. I heard the voice of God in my heart, not in my ears, but in my heart. And I heard him call me, uh, and he called me specifically because that's the way God is. Uh, you see, the point is he was, he, it, that, that Moses was in the most unlikely place, just, just the desert. Uh, and, and, but let me tell you, it wasn't just the desert. It was the backside of the desert, okay? We're not talking about just the desert, but the backside of the desert Uh, I mean when you're on the back side of the desert you're in a place that you know nobody else wants to go Uh, it's the farthest sector in the wilderness Uh, and so the emphasis here is that God can show up uh, in the most undesirable places uh, in the most distinct places Uh, and if you'll just listen God uh, will absolutely speak to you you say God never spoke to me well you know what the problem is you've never listened to God you're so busy running to and fro you're so busy with your life Uh, you're so busy doing all your things you got to do and get done uh, and before you know it years passed after year and year after year and you wake up one day and you realize that you know what uh, I've got a lot of time behind me maybe more time behind me than I got in front of me uh, but nevertheless uh, it happens it's called life uh, but you got to stop long enough uh, to see God uh, in this burning bush uh, and hear the voice of God calling you uh, and beckoning you for higher things. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. See, see, here's the deal. And I want to make a little statement. You must use discernment and wisdom to understand what I'm about to say. Otherwise, you'll say something I didn't say. We have present in, this, in the church world what I call revival chasers. Okay, people that they hear about a revival, man, I'm going to go there. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't go. I'm not saying you shouldn't go there. Okay, I'm not I'm not throwing any stones at anybody. Okay. Hello. (sighs) Maybe if I get there, I'm going to see God. That's that's the thought. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to say anything wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with it in itself. Go there. To go there, to be there, unless you limit God to that place. You say, I can't see God unless I go to that place. And that's what happened back in the 90s. I remember that. And and, and God did something down there in Pensacola, Florida. And I thank God for it. But the problem is people went down there thinking that's the only place God is. And then when they got down there and they saw people and they started and they came back and tried to act like that, they acted down there and try to, you know, be like they were down there. And the problem was they didn't pay the price. See, you don't know about that revival, but they prayed, I think, for five solid years for that revival. It wasn't just pop up overnight. Uh, but they put some work into it and they put some prayer into it and God showed up. And then, man, everybody flocked to go see God down there. Well, let me tell you something. You put some time in with what that, how they put some time in, God will move right where you're at at all right Uh, it's not a matter of going to find God Uh, it's a matter of getting your heart in place uh, and your life in place that God will show up where you're at Uh, he is God and he always will be God don't limit God to a place 
Not even this church. Man, I tell you what, if I can just get to church, why don't you get in a prayer closet? Man, if I could just, if I could just get to some of that teaching on Wednesday, and I wish you would, amen. Amen. <laughs> but that's okay. You need teaching. You need, but I'm just saying, if you need God, you don't have to wait till Wednesday night. Uh, I'm just going to touch God. I'm, I just can't wait till Sunday morning to get saved. Uh, why don't you get saved where you're at? Uh, why don't you get saved where, what's going on? If God convicts you, if he calls you by name, uh, you better listen to him. Uh, somebody said, well, if I could just get to Florida, if I could just get to Toronto, if I could just get to wherever, Baton Rouge, or, 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 or maybe the maybe center, if I can just get up to the the maybe center. I always crack me up, the maybe center, you know? You ever thought about that? The maybe center? Okay, anyhow, some of y'all got it and some of you didn't. I know it was named after a guy. It's not even spelled the same way, but still, yet yeah, it sounds funny. You know, the place of faith and power, but we're going to the maybe center. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. But, but if I could just get there, I, I, you know, let me tell you something. I've been to more meetings probably than anybody in this church house, okay? I've been to more meetings than you can shake a stick at. And honestly, I, I never went there thinking God is closer there than he is anywhere else. Uh, because I've had more face-to-face -face encounters with God all by myself in a prayer closet all alone uh, than I've ever had in church, okay? I'm just being honest with you. I've had some great experience in church. And I, I've been touched by God in church. Uh, but I tell you what, I've had more experiences on my knees. He's uh, seeking the face of God in a secret place. Uh, and when I get to that place, when you get to that place, uh, and there's nobody else around you, uh, and there's nothing to distract you, uh, you turn your TV off, you turn your telephone off, uh, you cut Facebook off, uh, and you just get in there and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here, and I may be alone, and I'm going to stay here till I'm not alone anymore. Uh, I'm telling you, there will come a place, uh, and there will come a time uh, that God will show up, uh, and when he shows Shows up, uh, he will change everything in your life. Uh, you need to get a hold of God. So it's not showing up where you think God is. It's when God shows up where you're at. I need God to show up where I'm at. Now, this, this, this book I'm preaching this morning is to be believed. Oh, yeah, it's to be believed. There's no other book like it on the planet. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a preacher. I'm saying that because I was lost as a goose in a hailstorm. I was as mixed up as a termite in a yo-yo. I was as frustrated as a bald-headed hippie. Uh, and one day I saw, I found him in this book. Uh, I seen him in this book. Uh, and from that time to this, I found out uh, this is not any ordinary book. Uh, this is not the cosmopolitan outdoor life, uh, the TV guide. Uh, but this is the word of God, quick and powerful. Uh, I said it's alive and powerful. Uh, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, it can pierce your heart. Uh, it can divide your soul uh, it can pick up on the intents of your heart and your mind uh, and it can change your life uh, because this book is alive uh, it is the word of the living God no doubt about that in my mind I, there's no doubt and all the skeptics have come too late to tell me I ain't no God I oh, put a sock in it man you ain't convincing me of nothing there's so much evidence in that book man you compare it to the evidence of, the, uh, of, of, of what they want to call what. You know, you know, evolution's even changing. You know that? No pun intended. It's changing. It's, a, it's evolving. Because, see, DNA came along, and they, they, they really can't even hold to that anymore. If you really understand DNA, evolution's impossible. They know that, but they're so stupid. Amen. Uh, and they're so ignorant and, and willingly ignorant. They know the, the, that that book, uh, it, they know that, that it's real, but they know that evolution's not. So what are they saying now? I tell you, in some of our lifetimes, they're going to do away with evolution, and they're going to say that aliens have come. You think I'm kidding? I don't mean that as a joke. They're already talking about it. And they're going to say aliens can. That's what it was. We know it wasn't evolution like, you know, like Darwin said. But, but you know what? Now we got the fuller revelation. But let me tell you something, you, 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 you dumbbell. Amen. Uh, if, if you just read this book, uh, there's nothing in it that's contradictory. Uh, if you think there is, come find it. I'll give you $5,000. Okay? Uh, 
I may have to borrow it from you, but or you or you, but but I'm going to give it to you if you can find anything. Comp- but but I have enough confidence. Uh, I know this book, uh, and this book tells me uh, everything I need to know about life. Well, what about the dinosaurs? What do I need a dinosaur for? Amen. Uh, I don't need a dinosaur, uh, but I was lost in my sin, uh, and I needed a savior. Uh, and the savior goes from Genesis to Revelation, uh, and thank God, behold, the Lamb of God, uh, who is t- Take away the sin of the world. And it's all in this book. In the book. It's a book to be believed. See, God will always meet you in the desert. You may, you may feel like at times that you're in the last sector of the universe. I felt like that before. Where's God at? We often call those places God forsaken places. But let me tell you something. With God, there is no God forsaken places. He's omnipresent. There's a scripture. I, I, Isaiah said, let's read it here. Well, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice. Blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of a dumb sing. For the wilderness shall break, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Uh, Now I know that's a prophetic word from God in Isaiah speaking of the coming of the Savior uh, but the point is he'll make streams in the desert. Uh, He'll make streams in the desert Uh, and if you've ever been in a desert place the thing you need the most is water Uh, and Isaiah is saying listen uh, write them the darkest and the driest places of your life uh, because there's one coming uh, and even John the Baptist said there's one coming uh, and I am not worthy to and undo his sandals uh, because he is of a greater rank than I. Can I tell you he's come? Uh, can I tell you he's here? Uh, can I tell you behold the Lamb of God uh, which taketh away the sin of the world? Uh, he is here and streams are in the wilderness now. The water of life flows and nobody has to be thirsty. You see, not only that, not only that, but Isaiah said, if you're trying to find God and where he's at and his whereabouts, you should make straight the desert. A highway for God. See, that's the path that he most often takes. You say, preacher, I'm in a desert. I, I, I'm in a wilderness. I, I feel so far away from God and I feel so dry. And, and my, my experience right now is not really what I want it to be. Well, you're in a good place. You're in the desert. God makes streams in the desert. You see, Jesus couldn't even begin his ministry till he had a showdown with the devil in the desert. Forty days and forty nights. And he put the devil in his place. And notice that the devil quoted the scripture. But he didn't quote it in context. You got to quote it in context. Jesus knew the context, and he says, Satan, it is written. It is written. Forty days, forty nights. The wilderness is where John the Baptist was found preaching and baptizing. It wasn't in the synagogue, it wasn't in the temple in Jerusalem. You would think that something of this magnitude would take place in the holy temple in Jerusalem because that's where God was supposed to be. But let me tell you something. That's not where God sent the man, John the Baptist. He sent him into the wilderness to preach and proclaim that Jesus has come and to baptize all those that would come to him. It was in the desert. Yeah. In the New Testament, Philip converted an Ethiopian or an Ethiopian eunuch. 
and baptized him in water in the desert. In the desert. Do not despise the desert place in your life. What you call desolate, God calls destiny. He wants you to encounter him in the desert. See, if you're in the city, if you're in some place where your attention is altered and you can't keep your focus, you'll never see God. That's what the devil does. He tries to keep us off balance. He tries to keep us, you know, so, so off balance that we just, we never have time to listen to God, never time to hear God, never time, have time to see God. But when you get in the wilderness, uh, as I've said before, if when you're on your back, there's only one way to look, and that is up. We ain't in the desert. Oh, you need some water, some refreshment. You need the presence of God. When God first met Moses in the desert, uh, I mean, it was on the backside of the desert. He met him in a wasteland. He met him in a place of want and poverty. He met him in a place that none of us want to be. More than likely, your first encounter with God was in a desert on the backside of your life. You met God in some back room, maybe, back alley. Dark place, lonely place. Maybe it was in a painful place. Poverty-stricken place. And if you're honest, you met God yesterday. And where you met God yesterday, you wouldn't want to be there today. Amen. That's just the way God works. See, See, sometimes God doesn't address your need until you're desperate. Because you're in a desert. And some of you right here, you, 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 all week long, you've been struggling. You've been really struggling with your life and, and all of this. And, 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 and you, you, just, you just don't know what else to do. I'm telling you what to do on this Sunday morning. And that is you need to get alone with God. You need to get alone with God. See, sometimes God, he shows up. He doesn't show up until you've gotten far away from all your support mechanisms. Sometimes God doesn't show up until you, and show you his glory until you quit glorying in yourself. It doesn't make a way until you give up on your way. He doesn't come to save you until you say, listen, God, I need a Savior, and I'm a sinner. I need to give up on saving myself. And that's where a lot of people are today. You need to give up on saving yourself and put your faith in the Savior because he is the Savior. And you need to move out of your comfort zone to get there because I'm telling you, the backside of the desert is not a very comfortable place. You say, man, I like comfort. I like ease. Well, let me tell you something. That's not where God is. God is in the desert. He's not in the place we call the comfort zone. you got to get up out of the comfort zone, and you got to get to where God can meet you. Uh, because God cannot speak to you in the palace while you're eating at Pharaoh's table. Uh, but God has a plan uh, and God has a purpose. Uh, and God said, if I can get him out of that, if I can get him out of there, and God got him out of there. Uh, I'm talking about Moses now. He sat at Pharaoh's table. He ate the best. He, he learned everything Pharaoh could teach him. Uh, I mean, he had the best of everything. He had the most treasure. He had the most pleasure. Uh, he had everything. And God said, I can't talk to you, Moses. Uh, I got to get you somewhere else. Uh, and you know, the story. God got him on the back side of the desert uh, and God has a way of doing it. Uh, you see, God has a plan. He wants to invest in your life. Uh, he wants to invest in who you are uh, and know that God can make you something that you're not. Uh, he wants to invest in you, uh, but he can never invest in you until you're completely uh, absolutely, totally and say, Lord, here I am. I've got nothing left but you. That's why a lot of people get saved in prison. That's why a lot of people get saved in jail. Now, I know we got some, I know, trust me. I know better than you. Some things I don't, but I know something better than you about that. Some people get jailhouse religion. If you give me a deferred sentence, Lord, I promise you, I'll be in church Sunday morning. Judge says, I'm going to give you a deferred sentence. See you later, suckers. Amen. 
forgot every promise you ever made to God. But I'm talking about some people do. I'm my buddy Dixie Pebworth that's been here. Amen. He said, God, I got, he got right with God. There's others sitting right here. I don't want to point any fingers, Brother Jim, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Amen. Gave his testimony the other night. You see, he, God says, I'll meet you there, but you've got to give me your heart. And when you do, God changes it. God changes it. Why did God meet Moses in the desert? Why did he? Because God had a, had a mission for Moses. God had a little, what we, we, we could call a liberation agenda. Go tell Pharaoh. Can I paraphrase here? Go tell Pharaoh, chump, let my people go. That was the message. Now, <laughs> uh, Moses, it's not about your location. It's about your proclamation. And Moses, it's not your address. I know where you lived, and, 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 and you've been in the desert for 40 years. And I know where my people are. And what I want you to do is get up, go back into Egypt, and tell Pharaoh, sucker, let my people go. <laughs> Amen. Mac, let my people go. He ain't going to like it. But I'll make him like it. He'll resist. But if you go in there and tell him, I'll show him a thing or two. <laughs> and God did. So, you know, he knew that the people of God were on the, in Egypt for 400 years. He knew Moses was on the backside of the desert for 40 years. So it's not where you live. It's about where you're going. It's about being set free. And that's what God wants you to understand this morning. He wants you to be set free. He wants you to be free to worship. He wants you to be free to praise. He wants you to be free to live your life in freedom. And the son says free is surely free indeed. He wants you to be free to live holy and to be what all God wants you to be. Uh, and Moses, when you get where you're going, be sure to tell everyone you see, uh, you tell them, I am has sent you. Tell them I sent you. I am. And I'll validate your overdue parking tickets. <laughs> They've been there too long. <laughs> 400 years. Going to get them out. It's time to go. It's time to fly. It's time to bounce. Amen. It's time to get up. Like Tom and Cruz. <laughs> Get it, but that's all right. It's time for you to be like a library and book. <sighs> Man, I'm, I'm going to ask my dentist if maybe he could bring some of that laughing gas <laughs> next Sunday morning. You get a hit of it before you come in, okay? I mean, that might change everything. <laughs> Amen. See, I don't need no laughing gas, but anyhow. Uh, it's time to, to, to make like a tree and leave. Kiss Pharaoh goodbye because I'm going to take you, Moses, and the people of God where they ain't coming back. They ain't coming back, Moses. Somebody needs to know who I am. And Moses, you're going to show them. Uh, somebody needs to know that I'm the intergenerational God. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and let me tell you, if you're 20 or younger or 30 and younger, uh, can I tell you, if you're just, if you still feel young, uh, he's not just the God of grandpa and grandma. Uh, he's not just your mom and daddy's God. Uh, he's your God too. Uh, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's intergenerational. Uh, he wants to save everybody, uh, and he wants to be a, you. He wants you to experience him in a real, dynamic, incredible way. Amen. Yeah, he's still in business. And I'm almost out of business, aren't I? I don't know about you, but when I read this scripture, I'm caught up trying to make sense out of this burning bush, barefoot, holy ground situation. I mean, we've all been born free moral agents. And, 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 and this incredible encounter with, with God was with 
it involved some risk. Yeah. Moses was asked to go, but Moses had a choice. And God has come to some of y'all, and he's called you. You've made your excuses, and you have a free will. God's not going to make you go. God's not going to make you be what he wants to make you. You've got to be willing. Moses had a choice. The New Testament enhances that thought. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt. He made his mind up. You got to make your mind up. A lot of people make their mind up in here. And the minute they leave the church and they get down the road, all of a sudden things change and they forget the commitments they've made. They forget the vows they've made. They forget how God dealt with them because now they just turn their music back on and they get back into their thing and they go on with their lives. But God doesn't want you just to go on with your life. He wants to do something supernatural and change your life. Amen. See, God, Moses took a risk. He's a wanted man down in Egypt. Post office, you go in the post office of Egypt, boom, there's a, there's a picture. Wanted, dead or alive, Moses. God, I'm wanted down there. They hadn't forgot that. But let me tell you something. Not only did Moses take a risk, but God took a risk on Moses. Really think about it. It wasn't just Moses' risk, and it's not just your risk, but it's God's risk, God's risk in encountering you. God took a risk. God took a risk in being born to a virgin woman in a sin-twisted world. God took a risk in being ridiculed and ostracized and, and, and despised and rejected and crucified in the, by the hands of sinful men. He took a risk. He took a risk uh, that he that knew no sin became sin, that we might be the righteousness of God. He took a risk. Uh, he took a risk uh, and because he slept all night Friday night, uh, and he slept all night Saturday, mo Saturday uh, and then Sunday morning he got up and rose from the dead. Uh, he took a risk in all of that. Uh, so don't tell me what God cannot, what, 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 what cannot be done. Well, you know, it can't be done. Let me tell you something. All all things are possible to them that believe. Uh, don't you tell me today uh, what you what we do, uh, what we don't have. We don't have this and we don't have that. He said, I'll supply all your needs uh, according to my riches and glory. Uh, don't tell me that. Uh, don't give me your doubt. Uh, don't tell me about your fears. Uh, whom shall I fear? Uh, and what shall I be afraid of? Uh, because if the Lord is on my side, I will not be afraid. Uh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, I will fear no evil uh, because the living God is with me uh, and as long as God is with me I shall not be afraid uh, amen don't tell me about your enemies he said a thousand shall fall at thy side of ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall not come nigh thee you see and by the way don't, don't, don't let me forget to tell you don't let me forget to tell you don't come any closer when God begins to get, don't, don't, don't take another step. Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Holy ground. See, here's the deal. And I'm going to tell you what the deal is. I need you all to come back, please. That means I'm close. God took a risk with Moses in dealing with him that day. I mean, after, by all accounts, why would you pick Moses? Let me just read his resume here. He was a murderer. He was a convict. He was an escapee, escapee in, in exile. private deal here he was hiding from justice he, he stuttered I mean the guy couldn't even preach let, 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 let me tell you 
I'm not making fun of him. Just telling him that's what he did. He couldn't. He stuttered. I mean, why would he choose him? Is this his resume? He lacked communication skills. For 40 years, he had been assigned to the inevitable task of presiding over stinking sheep on the backside of the desert. Yes, God took a risk with Moses. Yes, he did. But God takes a risk on us too. All of us. We're all of the unreliable crew, the undependable kind of people. The sometimey, wishy-washy set. <laughs> Aren't we? Oh, no, I'm a man, my word, preacher. Well, you probably are, most things, but you know what? You're not perfect. guy gave me a call the other day and wanted me to give him a letter to write a letter for him because he's trying to become a, a legal resident from Romania a friend of mine used to go to church with us he needed a letter I said man I'll tell you what I'll, I'll get you a letter brother And he said, by the way, he said, I got an invention that I'm come up with is some tires. And, and if it pans out, he said, I, I'm not kidding. And he's a smart guy. He's a kind of a technical guy. And he said, it could be worth millions. I said, how quick you need that letter? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> no, I really didn't have anything to do with that. But I said, I, I, I promise you, I'll get it for you. That was like on Thursday. No, it was on Wednesday. Could have been on Tuesday. I don't know. All I know is I got busy. I didn't do it. I promised him, though. Then, then I, 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 he, he texted me back, hey, how about that letter? I said, yeah, I'll get that. I said, it was on Friday now. I said, I promise you tonight. I'm, I, I'm in Tulsa right now. But when I get home, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that letter. Something came up. Now it's Saturday. And he sent me one more text. And I said, listen, I promise you, as soon as I get through eating, I'm going to send you the letter. Got through eating, typed out the letter and sent it to him. But man, it took me all those days to do it after I promised. I'm just giving you an example. Nobody's perfect. Amen? Don't look at me like that. Amen? I was true to my word, but just a little late, but not too late for him. Because he's got to take it when he goes to get naturalization but we're that kind of people we're undependable sometimes well I, I, I just don't see the vision because you walk by sight not by faith seriously we're the kind of people that can sing and shout like angels on Sunday morning And live like the devil on Saturday night. Some of us. Not all of you. Just the person sitting next to you. <laughs> oh, man. I probably won't have a crowd next week, but that's okay. Because I want you to get close to God. You get close to God, you forget about me. What I've said. Because God wants to talk to you. He took a risk on us is what I'm saying. He didn't have to, but he did. Could have chose anyone else but us. He should have chose anyone else but us. He could have invested his time, his resources in other people, but he chose to, to choose you. What are you going to do with it? God risks his 
risks on us. That's the reason you need to take off your shoes. The question is, what, what makes this holy ground? Why did he have to take his shoes off? And I'm closing. The reason Moses took his shoes off was because God was there. It was holy ground because God was there. And now he was saying, Moses, I want you to take your shoes off because I want everything that separates you, you and me. I want you to get on that holy ground and nothing will separate us. You see, that's why the Jews wear the yarmulke, the little thing on top of their head, because they feel like in their place, in their position, there must be something between them and God because God is so holy. But God said, I don't want no yarmulke on your head. I want you to take the yarmulke off. I want you to take your shoes off. I want everything that separates you from me. And I want you to seek me with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And I want you to have an encounter with me. But you got to you got to get rid of everything that will separate you and I. You see... God met him there in the dirt. God will meet you there too. And I thought, that's inter interesting to me because on the dawn of creation, God stepped down out of eternity into time, took a little bit of dirt, created a man, called him Adam, and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. One day, Jesus ran into a blind man. And Jesus used dirt to do his surgery with. Jesus had a discourse with a little lady that had been caught in the act of adultery. What did he do? He reached down, began to write in the dirt. <laughs> dirt is dirt. Just ordinary dirt. It's only ground. It's only soil. It's only sand. It's only dirt. But God uses ordinary dirt for extraordinary purposes. And where God manifests himself that in that dirt, that dirt becomes holy ground. Now, you see, you can't make it holy. I can't make it holy. Uh, there's nothing we can do to make the place we stand on holy. It doesn't matter how righteous you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how faithful you are. You can't make it holy. You can put up all the signs you want to put. Say, this is a holy place. Uh, you can make your declarations. You can call it the holy place all you want to. But I'm telling you, uh, you cannot make dirt holy. Angels can't make dirt holy. God is the only one that has the divine power uh, to make ordinary dirt holy. Uh, and I want you to know where God is, that's the place of communion. Uh, it's a place of justification. Uh, it's the place of sanctification. Uh, and did you know you've been made out of dirt? Uh, and God wants to show up in the dirt. Amen. He wants to have an encounter in the dirt. Uh, he wants you to know know him and experience him and he wants you to know him today oh God help us so the word for the hour is this take off your shoes take off your shoes I'm not talking about literally take off everything that separates you and God if anything separates you and God, and you know what those things are I don't have to give you a list this morning I don't have to give you any kind of a hint you have a conscience and the spirit deals with that conscience and he says don't do that and you know it's not right it's separating you from God take your shoes off take your shoes off take everything off that separates you from God and I promise you a life that you can never ever imagine Father in Jesus name